and welcome to the Concise Verbal Communication webinar, or um, how to talk and communicate more by talking less. And so we have a special new mouse for this webinar. If you've been here before, you've seen my little mice. This is the quiet mouse. So the first thing that I wanted to broach is a very philosophical start, which is there's, there's a theory that says there's only two possible motivations for a human being to do anything or a mouse being. One is love and the other one is fear. So in order to be quiet, we need to be brave. And in order to be quiet, that means we need to have a certain level of trust in our audience. And so in order to allow others to speak, you need to try and be aware of what you're afraid of and not be afraid of that. So in a nutshell, I would say that that is the way to be concise, is to be aware of yourself and to be aware of what you're afraid of and then not be afraid of it. Um, so we're going to talk about why do we talk too much sometimes? Why should we talk less? What are the benefits of that? How can we talk less? Of course, it's easier said than done. And when should we talk less? And conversely, when should we talk more? Which option describes you best? Um, do you talk too much? Not enough? Do you think others need to stop talking so much? So most people say they don't speak up enough. So what I'm hoping for, um, as you'll see, is that by having more confidence that you're not talking too much, hopefully that will help more people to speak up enough. This webinar is about how to use concise speaking to deliver your message better and to develop effective relationships. So you can think of when you're listening, it's like you're giving your other person. When you listen, it's like you're giving a, a gift of flowers. So disclaimer, this webinar is not a recommendation to be quiet when you have important things to say. So speaking up at the right time is just as important as being silent at the right time. So I just wanted to make that disclaimer that I'm not telling everybody to be quiet all the time. So sometimes a hero is someone who bravely says the words that need to be said, even if it seems like it's a ticking corporate time bomb. You know, sometimes we need to say the unpopular thing. So in this webinar, we'll study how to be a person that others will listen to. Because if you think about it, a lot of times in a group, the person who's quiet is the person that you listen to when they do talk because they're going to say something worth listening to. So good interactions are a balance between listening and talking. So you don't want to be the person who's always talking all the time. You might want to be the person who's more quiet. And then when you say something, everybody else is surrounding you and listening and paying attention to you. So why do we talk so much? Throw some reasons into the chat as to why you think we talk too much. What are the reasons that people talk too much? Give me some interaction in the chat. Nervous, good one. Yeah, to fill a void. Anxious, I feel like I should talk more. Uh, you want to make sure the message gets across, yes. Uh, anxiety, wanting to give a good impression, to convince others about something. Yeah, over convincing people is an interesting one. Yeah, not sure about being clear. Great ideas. Um, so, this matches what people have put in the chat. So anxiety, controlling the situation. Um, sometimes people aren't aware that they're talking too much. Uh, sometimes people, you know, it can be really considered to be unmannerly to talk too much. So I think that's something we need to be aware of is that if you are a person who has good manners, that often means that you are a person who is conscious of your behavior. You're conscious of opening the door for other people. You're conscious for stopping yourself and letting others speak. Um, and then a few people have said this in the chat is that when you're trying to ex explain yourself and you're maybe not as sure of your message, you repeat yourself over and over or you give another example and another example. And what if you just stopped? and let that space rest. And then your listener could maybe ask you questions that might work better than just continuing to talk. Sometimes not, but we, it's, all, it's all a balance, right? It's a balance. Um, so how do we stop talking too much? General, knowing is half the battle. So if we resolve to be self-aware and we be conscious of ourselves, you can actually stop yourself. So I live alone. Well, I live as a teenager, but that's like living alone. And 
I, I have this thing where sometimes I go out in public and I think the first person that I see, I just go, and I talk and talk and talk. And sometimes I just stop myself right in the middle of a paragraph or right in the middle of a sentence. And I say, actually, I really do want to hear about you. And you know what? You can do get that. You can stop right in the middle of a sentence and say to the other person, I want to hear what you have to say on this. You don't have to worry about finishing the sentence. Usually the other person will be grateful to be acknowledged. And if they want to hear you finish your sentence, they'll probably just ask you. Um, so two visualizations to be conscious of your own talking because stopping yourself talking is not easy and it's a habit. So I would say with, you know, being aware of myself that when I go out in public, I talk too much. Um, I'm aware of it. So then I stop myself. So do you let others get a word in edgewise? That's a question for yourself to consider. And here's some ways that you could visualize it. So these uh, two mice are like giving a little conversation. Conversations would be more normal if she would just regulate better. Maybe she needs a scuba diving regulator. Yeah, come up for air. So you can imagine if you are talking so long that it's more than a snorkel full of air, you need to stop and let the other person in the conversation speak. So another kind of rhythm that you can think of in the conversation is like music. So these messages here, these breath marks, that is actually breath marks were written in music before commas were written in sentences historically. So commas and sentences are that space where we pause and breath marks in music are the space where we pause. So you should think of a conversation as a piece of music between two people. And so are you pausing? So maybe you're talking, you're talking, 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 and then you kind of pause and you let the other person say what they have to say. So think, think of it like that. Um, the pause is also the recommended cure for verbal tics. So we all say, um, well, like you see, um, and my personal favorite from rural Ontario is I swan. Um, so you want to, if you're giving a speech, obviously you don't want to be saying these words over and over again. So one way to be more concise is to simply edit yourself, you know, record yourself on a video and pay attention. How many filler words do you use? Um, you can record a video and then like we would do in an education degree is just watch that video and actually keep a little chart and tick off how many times you do that in a number of minutes. And if you're doing it quite a lot, then you need to pause. So the cure, that um, last slide and the next one here are about what do you do with pauses, right? Instead of saying, um, you train yourself to pause. And so it's not like some people are naturally good listeners and some people are naturally good speakers. This is a skill you can practice and develop. Um, and I was also going to mention in the rhythm thing, when you record a video, you know, often it, audio visual editors will delete all of the ums and ahs and those extra filler words. But sometimes if they delete too many of them, so this happened when we were developing the course um, for the, the courses we're doing with UBC here is that the video editor deleted all of the pauses I had in the lesson at some point. And I said, well, that actually, we need to put some of those pauses back because you can't just talk for 10 minutes straight with no break. There is a rhythm. And so sometimes you need to take a pause. It's better if you're not using filler words, if you're just pausing, that gives your audience time to absorb what you've said. So there's also a space for not going too quickly but instead of using um and ah, actually just stop, leave empty space, embrace the empty space. So this, I took this small little paragraph out of this Harvard Business Review, um, Harvard Business Review article, the link is right there. So um, despite how they may feel at first, a well-placed pause makes you sound calm and collected. So if you're always saying um, 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 you might not sound calm and collected, but if you just actually stop, people respect that and they enjoy that sometimes. So if you lose your train of thought, just pause and get back on track. As long as you don't do it for too long, the audience will not hold it against you. Calm your nerves. So taking a pause before starting a speech 
is especially important for people with a fear of public speaking as it helps to calm your nerves, right? You take a deep breath and then you go on just like a singer. Um, this tactic is also useful in the middle of a speech. If you find yourself getting flustered, just pause, <sighs> deep breath, right? And also it's not necessarily just defense or nervousness. When you put a pause in, it gives people time to think. Um, and I know that when my original training was as a school teacher, the pause is the hardest thing. You know, when you ask the students a question, you actually have to leave space for the students to answer. They don't always have the answer right on the tip of their tongue. And that, that waiting is one of the hardest parts of teaching, not the talking, but the waiting. Um, so strategically placed silence can emphasize and it can give the audience time. So if you've been in any of my other webinars, I have probably mentioned white space. And so this page has a nice amount of white space, right? We can see there's three points. They're surrounded by white space. So that gives them emphasis. So silence, silence is the white space of talking. So silence and white space have the same function of emphasizing the words that are in between them. So like filler words, pauses give you a chance to take a break and figure out what comes next. So pause makes you confident, whereas if you overuse filler words, you sound nervous. So it's just training yourself. So what happens when we talk too much? So write some consequences of talking too much in the chat. People get irritated, absolutely, and they stop listening and get annoyed and avoid us. And we seem aggressive, excellent, and we lose our audience. And you say more than you mean to. Oh yeah, good one. People tune you out. So you guys already have, you know what happens. I guess we all know what happens. Listeners switch off and they fall asleep and then they just aren't tuned in, right? It's the same thing as reading a whole entire wall of text. Listening to a whole entire wall of text is just as miserable. And of course, which as people kind of hinted at in the, in the chat, you can ruin your relationships. I think we all know somebody that we don't want to telephone anymore because they're not going to let us get a word in edgewise and it's not fun to talk to them on the phone and they don't have a regulator. They need a scuba diving regulator. Just like that mouse. So why talk less? So when you stop talking, you learn more about the people around you and the wealth there's a reason we call it a human resource. So this photo is women in 1959. And you know, women in 1959 in North America were typically not listened to very much. And so that's particularly why I put them here. So if we look at this crowd shot, okay, you can imagine we might hear these people because they're talking loudly, it looks like, right? These people are politely putting their hands up, these two women here. So they've got things to say. They may or may not get heard. But I feel like this woman is the one that catches my attention. I feel like she's like a nuclear physicist or something. And she's not going to bother to speak up unless somebody specifically asks her, right? So if we just talk, 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 we're not gonna get the knowledge out of any of these people. We're gonna get the, the knowledge from the young people, right? That's it. Um, so if you can stop talking, you learn about the assets, experiences, and passions of the people around you. And you can stop yourself in the middle of a paragraph and see what's going on with you. So I also wanted to bring up, I think an extraordinary social phenomenon in our day and age is the barista. Baristas get love because they listen. One, they give delicious coffee, that's good. But also the reason people go back to the same coffee shop over and over and over again is because they'll be listened to. Here's a beautiful coffee. And by the way, how's your day? Right. And so if you listen to people and you ask them questions, they're going to be way more enthusiastic about their projects, which I'm going to touch on more in the next slides. So people listen better if you don't turn them off, which we've already talked about in the chat, right? They're going to focus on you more strongly and you'll, you'll have better action on the follow up items. So some strategies, how to talk less when you're giving presentations. Hmm. What's wrong with this slide? There's something wrong with this slide. How to talk less when you're having one-on-one -on -one conversations. How to talk less in, you know, I could talk less 
if I just took away the how to talk lesses and change the title a little bit. So strategies for talking less, giving presentations or teaching, one-on-one -on -one conversations, in group conversations, and how about the times that we should talk more? So what I did there is I just used fewer words, told you the same topics, but it's way more easy for you to process this even verbally than this because I just repeated how to talk less when, how to talk less when. So this is one of the benefits of, of using a table or a bulleted list is you can reduce the number of words. So we can do that in writing as we've already seen in other webinars and you can do it in talking. So here's another little poll or a little quiz. What lesson did the past two slides teach about how to speak concisely? So there's actually more than one possible answer to the quiz which is all three of these things are true, right? Um, so editing your presentation can help you refine and reduce your words was the main one that I wanted and the one that most people got. But you know, also using tables can reduce words and practicing your presentation helps you get organized. So we're gonna talk some more about that in some future slides here. I can close this. Um, so use the text in the room is also another great way to reduce the words that we use. So other people bring a lot as we talked about with this. Your students are never ever starting at zero, not even if you're teaching kindergarten, right? Every class that you teach, people walk in there with a wealth of conversation, a wealth of information and experience. And if we let them speak, then often we can speak a whole lot less and our students can just say the answers for us. In fact, I could have just used the chat answers and not even put up some of these answers because you guys had a lot of this information already. It's just a matter that here gives us a place to gather and talk about it. So one, another way that you can speak less when you're giving a presentation, especially if it's a corporate presentation is have senior people in the room. So I know when I was, um, presenting at a company to teach, you know, reporting, say, um, if you can get senior people in the group to come into that room, then they will and provide opportunities for them to tell stories and give examples. They will say a lot of the things that you would have said anyways, but because people are hearing it from different voices, and especially if they're hearing it from their own bosses or people that they respect, then that reinforces you being at the front of the room and it's more compelling and interesting for your audience. Um, so if you can discuss that with those senior members ahead of time, then you can even tailor those classes to those specific groups of people. Um, so if you can, the more specific the group you can present to, the more tailored you can make that information, obviously. So we've gone backwards. Let's try going forwards. So if your crowd does not seem to be speaking up enough, so this can happen if you have a total random assortment and you don't know who you have, or if you have an uncomfortable corporate environment and people don't feel as comfortable speaking out in the group, um, then what you could do is you could have people form groups. So, or for example, another one, if you only have junior people and you can't get any senior people, um, so form people into groups and then give them prompts, questions or writing prompts, and then you might have them write on chart paper or, I mean, this is happening obviously a lot. Breakout groups on Zoom meetings, I just think they're revolutionary. Like the pub quiz format is fantastic. So um, you can form people into groups of, I, four is kind of ideal, I think. They say four to six, but you know, if you have four people, everybody gets a chance to speak. When you have six people, I find that often two people don't get a chance to talk very much. So you can break people into four person breakout groups um, and then people can come back to the big group and say what they came up with. And I've been in a number of pub quiz type things over the last year with various groups all around the world and it works fantastic. You talk to the other people in your group of four, then you come back to the main group, uh, you talk about your answers, then you might go with a different group of four or go back to your group of four. Um, and you know, if you have a bunch of experienced professionals, so for example, I belong to the Mediterranean editors and translators, everybody there is like over 40, 50, 60. We don't need to learn content as much as just learn from each other. So in, in a case of that, think of yourself more as a facilitator 
rather than a presenter who needs to talk a lot. So in terms of concise speaking, you know, let the other people speak and then you don't have to speak so much. Now here's a lesson for in-person, should we ever get back to the in-person world again. Um, but this could also have a context in Zoom. So just to learn this lesson. So where you place your body as a school teacher or as a presenter at a conference can make a huge difference to how the room functions and how people learn. Okay, so my favorite corporate format is probably this U-shaped one um, because then everybody is kind of, it, it forms a circle. This is also what I prefer for like meditation groups and yoga as well. When you've got those circular formats, people are just sort of focused in the center and focused on each other in a sharing way. I like that. Um, of course, the rows, um, you know, people can disengage a lot more easily. In a row, you might want to have groupy formats if you're going to be doing group work. Um, so another point about where you put your body that school teachers learn, and that's useful if you're in a conference, um, is that if people are being disruptive, just where you put your body can stop them being disruptive. So all teachers know that if you just walk close to the people that are off task, they will often get back on task. And so I also had a situation when I was, I decided to go all the way down the west coast of the states and teach at all of our Golder offices all through California and Washington and everything. And most Golder offices, people were super happy to see me and, uh, you know, let's have lunch. And everybody came to the conference and the seniors were there and the juniors were there and it was a good feeling thing. But one office I showed up at and the bosses obviously were not going to take time off at lunch to attend this webinar or not webinar in person lunch and learn the um, so, you know, that other people were also very reluctant to attend this lunch and learn. I guess lunch probably was not provided for them. Um, if you've done any lunchtime meetings at work, you know that providing food is a really good draw for people. I like to make banana bread if I happen to be in my hometown. Banana bread or cookies or chocolates is a very good bribe to get people happy at your webinar. Um, but so what happened was they dragged all the people into this room and we were all around like one central table and two or three, I think it was just two of the women were on their phones texting. They were giggling together. You know, it was like junior high school, obviously weren't respecting or valuing the fact that I had showed up there. So I just waited. I just stood there. I don't think my knees were trembling too much. They were probably trembling a little bit, but I just waited and I watched them just as if we were in junior high school since they were acting like junior high school. And what that does is that makes everybody in the room look towards those people. And then pretty soon it was quiet. They paid attention. And once I started talking, they realized I had something reasonable to say and everything went well after that. But that's definitely a case of if I had just tried to talk through that moment, I wouldn't have had the attention of the room for the whole hour. That would have continued off being distracting, the energy would have been incohesive and, and chaotic. So there is, you just have to stop, be centered in your, in your body and your energy and, and just be sure of your message and use that before you go on. So in that case, no amount of words would have stopped those people doing that. Only a concise silence was the way to stop that. And I have to say, as a school teacher, I've tried all the words, be quiet, class, stop, please focus on the board. That doesn't work. Only quietness works, especially with adults. So now we're gonna have a little section on conference talks. So when you're presenting at academic conferences, if you are disorganized, there's a 100% chance you will talk too much. Um, just like we were talking about with concise writing, younger writers often use too many words. The more experienced people get, the more concise they are. It's the same thing with a conference presentation. If you, the less experience you have, the more you should practice right? Edit your presentation, practice, 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 and then you will not talk too much. You will only say you'll get more focused. So one of the profs that's uh, a guest lecturer in the UBC course, he talks about for his research group, he's, he teaches um, chemistry and researches chemistry. So he has all of his grad students actually present orally to their research group before they ever put their words onto paper. And he finds that by them presenting that orally, that really focuses their message because you don't wanna just stand up and say, you don't know what. 
So sometimes it can be really helpful to talk things out before you even try to write them. Um, so another, you know, this is very general that which you know, not too many words on the slide and use images to help you organize your facts and then you'll use fewer words. So graphs can replace a lot of words. Um, photos, especially if you're doing geotechnical presentations, you know, there's nothing like a site, an image of the site replaces so many words. Um, and even a two by two table, as we already showed. Now here's a special danger, which we've all, I'm sure experienced. Academic conferences um, have those people who want to talk about how smart they are. And so they'll stand up and they'll grab the microphone and they don't even have a question for you. And they just start on this story and they embark on it and they yammer on and on and on. And so what you have to do with that is have some strategies ahead of time. If you're talking at an academic conference, you're going to run into one of those people. So you can practice at somewhere like Toastmasters. And I think Toastmasters even has online sessions now. Practice things such as parking. So when somebody starts talking about, oh, when I was in California one year and we had this project and it was all about, and you can say, oh, well, we have several other people who wanna ask questions about the thing that I just spoke about. Let's talk about your stories um, after the talk and then park it. So you do have to learn how to be assertive enough to actually stop those people in mid flow, which is not at all easy. And I think we've all been in conferences where the MC or the conference facilitator does not have the skills to stop that assertive person. So it's worth developing this skill. And you, as the speaker, you can practice this and you do have the right to stop those people because the other people in the audience also probably don't wanna hear their story. They wanna discuss your talk. Um, so do you have any other tips for presentations? Um, write them in the chat if you would like to. So specifically about academic conference presentations. Yep, practice it out loud often, thank you. And use visuals, excellent. Activities is also very good. Analogies, small titles. Yeah, make a story with visuals, dry runs with trusted people, prepare slides for questions that you expect. Oh, that's a great one, especially if you have graphs or data that's gonna support your answers. One-on-one -on -one conversations. How do we get the other person to talk more? So obviously we can ask them about themselves, ask them about their ideas, prepare leading questions. So particularly, um, I really liked in the course, we had uh, a section about one-on-one -on -one conversations for, for managers, particularly to talk to the people they manage. Um, and one of the things is, you know, just be silent and let the other person talk. So they were saying, in, as the project manager, instead of going in with a list of things for your subordinate to say, this and this and this went wrong with the project, and how, how would you address it next time? Instead, just say, um, what would you do with this next time? And how do you think it went? And so if you do that, then as the manager, you're gonna get a lot of information you wouldn't get if you defined the problems to start with. So just try going in undefined. Embrace the silent pauses and make space for the other person to fill. So. As the manager, if you could just say, how do you think that project went? Instead of saying, here's how the project went. And if they don't come up with all the answers that you said, or you thought you were gonna say, um, what then? What if you actually didn't say all the things that you went into that meeting planning to say? Think of that ahead of time. Maybe it would be fine. Maybe you could follow up the next day with the things you planned to say. And another really important thing for one-on-one -on -one meetings, I had to bring these guys in, fog and smog. This is a really great rap video. I'm not a rap person, but put your phone down. These guys are all wearing shirts saying, put your phone down and they have angry faces because this video is all about putting your phone down. And so one of the man a lot of the management strategies are put your phone face down on the table or even leave your phone at your desk actually attend to the person that you are with. And as, as a family person, 
I think we, we all do this crime against our families that we don't put our phones down. So if we're gonna be active listeners, we have to put our distractions away. And so here's the question I was asking before too. What if you left this meeting without saying everything that you thought you had to say? Like, what if? Next time you go into a one-on-one -on -one meeting, think about that. What, what if you went into this meeting and you opened the topic and you didn't say every single thing? Would that be okay? Maybe that would be okay. Um, so here's uh, the Toastmasters webpage, and they have some very great articles on listening. So people think of Toastmasters as a speaking club, but actually, if you want to be a good speaker, you also have to be a good listener. And so they are a good resource. And then Stephen Covey, who is also now part of the company Franklin Covey, um, is a author that many people look up to. And he says, most of us do not listen with the intent to understand. We listen with the intent to reply. So before we even hear what the other person has to say, we have that list of things that we came to the meeting with. We have that list of things we want to show how smart we are. And so we're not actually listening. So again, go into that meeting and think, what if I didn't say? Um, so active listening strategies actually say yeah and mm-hmm i have a friend my best friend on the phone he won't actually say mm-hmm so you know you say are you still there we need people to say mm-hmm um eye contact is very important so again not having your phone anywhere near look at them um another thing i think is nice so that you're not staring at them the whole entire time is bring a notepad make a few notes about what they say you don't have to write whole sentences, but show that you're paying attention, show that you value what they're saying. Ask questions, ask questions to clarify what they're saying. Even if you just ask a question that gets them to repeat what they're saying, they're going to feel listened to. And so that feeling listened to is probably more important than the actual content in terms of building relationships, feeling listened to. Um, so this web page, I think is, an amazing resource. So resources right here under Franklin Covey, they have a whole bunch of like um, PDFs with cartoons that you can download. And some of them are just about listening. And so I would go there if you want to study this more. Now, what about if you're the boss? This is a phrase from my dad. He says, walk softly and carry a big stick. So if you're the boss, you can be quiet. People are going to listen when you do talk, right? So when to talk less in a group. So imagine you're in a working group. So if you're the boss, you should probably speak less. Um, if you're the tallest, and especially if you're the tallest man, I think you should probably talk less and try to get more information out of the women because there's a very high statistical chance that the women in the group are speaking less. Not always but often. Um, another really good time to talk less is if you don't know what you're talking about. But as we all know, the people who don't know what they're talking about often seem to talk the loudest and the most. So again, you are gonna imply more authority if you say less. And you kind of can apply less authority when you say more. And I know I was talking to one colleague about six months ago, and he said the weirdest thing. He said, never hang up the phone first. If you hang up the phone first, then you've lost the battle. And I thought, what kind of a strange power trip is that? What kind of a strange power game is that? That you just talk even when you have nothing to say. I think that's a little bit misguided. Um, something that my dad used to say he would do as a project manager is if, if you're around a table in a client meeting, and you want a project to go through, it's actually better to try and lead the conversation so that the other person says your idea. And if the other person says your idea, they're all over it. They're gonna be behind it. They're gonna buy into it. They're gonna be enthusiastic about it. So by not saying the thing, or maybe you just say one or two things to try and get them to say the actual words, then you win. If you say the words, then automatically in a meeting, they reject it, right? 
when to talk more in a group, because as I promised, you don't always want to talk less. You should speak up if you have a question. Um, make sure it's a good question. So don't talk about, don't just ask questions if they're not intelligent questions, but do ask questions. Um, I know I started my career uh, through email um, as an editor, and a lot of people would say, in the, in, so this goes with the email forums too, because email is our way of speaking a lot of times these days. People say, oh, I didn't want to ask a question and appear that I was dumb. But if you never ask a question, you don't start any conversations either. So you should feel confident to ask questions. You should feel confident to say your ideas. And especially if you're a woman, and especially if you're short, or if you're transgender, or if you're the only colored person in a group of white people, or you know any way different that makes you feel like you should be quiet, then maybe you should speak up more. Maybe you should just press yourself and try to speak up more. Um, when you're in authority and you need to correct false ideas, then you should speak up and not let them, not let false ideas rest. Um, I want to say that if you are not in authority and somebody has false ideas, you might not want to speak up. You might want to wait and address and ask the person in authority to address in a work context. Of course, if it's something like racism or sexism or somebody's bullying somebody else, then I think we should all speak up immediately. Um, but sometimes if there's false ideas at work or something, you might choose to pause, be a little bit quiet and take that offline, take it out of the group and see if you can correct it by other channels. 